Hey guys, what's going on? It's Preston here from The Legendarium. Welcome to episode number two, part one of the 30-minute author interviews. Here at The Legendarium, we're shining a light on indie publishing. Not only do we hope to interview your favorite author, but we hope you find a new favorite author through this podcast. This week, our guest is Chris Porto. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy 30 Minutes with Chris Porto. Uh, welcome, everybody, to this episode of 30-Minute Author Interviews. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Chris Porto. Well, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, so uh, for those that don't know anything about you, why don't you uh, just kind of give us an introduction about who you are and what you do? Okay. Uh, well, I've been an independent author for about three years now. Um, I write uh, horror fiction, sci-fi, post-apocalyptic fiction, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, I've got, I don't know, four or five novels um, out there, novel-length works anyway, out there. Uh, one of them is a collection of novellas and a short story called uh, Tales of Bee Company, which is set in Michael Bunker's world of Pennsylvania. Uh, but it collectively, it's about a novel's length. Um, and um, I'm also an editor. I put together a collection of short stories called Tales of the Apocalypse last fall, uh, which collected 14 stories uh, from the perspective of or featuring a main character uh, from the uh, animal world. Uh, and that was a, a pretty successful venture. Um, that's on Amazon now. So uh, writer mainly, but also an editor. Awesome. We'll get into it later, but Tales of the Apocalypse was probably one of my favorite anthologies last year. Oh, well, thank you very much. I really thank enjoyed you. it. So kind of tell us, um, I'd be interested how you got into indie publishing. I was listening to um, an interview you did. I forget what podcast it was. And you had mentioned that before you um, got into indie publishing, you actually tried to go traditional publishing a little bit. So can you kind of tell us uh, how you got interested in being an author and then what got you interested in uh, becoming an indie author? Sure. Uh, well, so I'm going to turn 50 this year, and I'm telling you that so that we can kind of go back about 30 years. <laughs> okay. uh, I, I wrote my first novel, which is still in a drawer somewhere, when I was uh, in graduate school, so I would have been about 20 or 21 years old. And at that time, uh, I had actually written some, some short stories that got an agent's interest, uh, and I had an agent or two or three, actually, uh, when I, about 30 years ago. Uh, and, uh, the agents didn't really work out. They didn't really do much for me. And so this was, you know, you're a 20 something and you think you know everything and you have all the energy in the world. Um, and so I had thought at that time, uh, sort of, and, but, and this is way before the only alternative to traditional publishing at that time was vanity press. Uh, which, what is a vanity press? Well, you pay uh, an independent publishing house to publish your book for you. Um, and in general, that's uh, looked down upon as, wow, you had to pay somebody to publish your book? Well, it must really suck. Um, and I, I refused to do that. Uh, so at that time, uh, as I made my way through several agents, um, I had I had gone the traditional publishing route because there really was no other alternative to that other than the vanity press. Um, so that was about 30 years ago. And uh, set all that aside, I got disgusted with not getting any traction there in the, in the traditional publishing vein and uh, set all that aside. Well, um, around 2000 or so, uh, I wrote a novel uh, that's called Shadows Burned In, and uh, I had drafted it then. Now, I, was in, I had been in graduate school, so I learned how to write really long sentences uh, with lots of prepositional phrases and 10-cent words. Uh, and that's the way Shadows was originally written. Okay. Uh, and just not, not, not as good as it could be, right? I mean, you learn to write a certain way and that's the way it comes out. And, and uh, anyway, so I, I had drafted that up and I tried to find one of those old agents again because again, you know, by then, you know, 15 years or so had passed and, uh, I was kind of like, well, I'd like to do this writing thing. And I'd always wanted to be a writer. I mean, I'd, I'd been writing all my life, short stories and stuff. And so, um, so I reached out and didn't get any traction there and, again, shelved uh, the book, uh, Shadows. And then this would have been 2012 or so. I uh, 
was looking on Amazon and I saw some books that looked interesting. Uh, Nick Cole's Old Man in the Wasteland was one of them. Uh, Ed Robertson's Breakers series was another one. I think that he had collected the first three Breakers novels into a, a free collection. Uh, and Rob- Roberto Colossus' The Scourge, which was the first in his medieval England zombie trilogy, uh, I read those three collections or those three works and I, and I saw, wow, these guys published independently. They don't have a traditional publisher. It's not Vanity Press either. And wow, these are actually really good. These guys are really good writers, especially Cole's, uh, Old Man in the Wasteland. I was just blown away by that. Um, and I thought, well, okay, maybe here's a third alternative, not traditional publishing, not Vanity Press. Let's try independent publishing. And so I, sh- Shaped up shadows, rewrote it about 16 or 17 times, trying to get all that academic language out and approach out, um, and put it out there. And that was September of 2013, and uh, that's where it's that's where it's gone since. So, so was Nick Cole was was he the first indie publisher that you read, or was there someone else before Nick Cole? I think Nick. Well, see, it was sort of Nick and Ed and Roberto all at the same time. Okay. They, they had this sort of collective impact on me of, wow, these guys are publishing their own stuff, and it's not, it's not Vanity Press, and it doesn't suck. It's actually really, really good. Right. Uh, but, but Nick Cole, I actually uh, wrote him an email. I think it was, or I, li- I think I liked. I think I gave him a review on Goodreads or something, and then he connected with me on Goodreads, and then we traded a few emails, and he was very encouraging. Uh, about me getting into independent, independent publishing. He read Shadows for me uh, and uh, uh, thought it was a, a decent effort and uh, really encouraged me. And so, and I, and I've, I've formed friendships with Ed and Roberto as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, and that's one of the things I would say about the indie community is that, you know, going back to that traditional publishing model, you have this, this sense of Stephen King as this, uh, this guy who lives in a in an old uh, uh, scary mansion in Maine, which he does actually. Um, but you know, th- there's this distance, right? There are these writers that live up here on these pedestals, and they s- sort of throw these uh, great works of fiction off, and people catch them like money in the streets and read them, and oh my God, these are just so wonderful. And and you know, th- that was sort of the traditional model, right? But then I reach out to Nick Cole. And he's like, hey, yeah, how's it going? Da, da, da. Oh, wow, You're, you you buy toilet paper in the grocery store like everybody else, huh? <laughs> right. Wow, that's cool. Uh, and that, that's been across the board with everybody. Uh, uh, Roberto is the same way, Michael, Ed, uh, Michael Bunker. Uh, I reached out to him. He's a fellow Texan, and, and he read Shadows and was enthusiastic about it. And uh, anyway, I, I can't think of a single independent author that I've talked to or reached out to, whether it's through Facebook or Goodreads or any other medium uh, that has it been really, really encouraging and, and very friendly about the whole venture. So, you know, it kind of destroyed that uh, the Greek gods living in the clouds model that we used to have of, of authors and they're unapproachable and, you know, all of that kind of thing. They're just people just like you and me. And, and that gave me a lot of encouragement in and of itself just to continue with the independent publishing route. Yeah, that's that's one thing I love about the indie community is um, everybody is so open to help um, everybody. It's not like, you know, it seems like in in the real world it's kind of like, you know, the dog eat dog mentality and people aren't wanting to help each other out that much. But then with the indie community, everybody is just so supportive and will help you in any way that they can. Right. It's it's a really kind of a karmic approach to things, you know, uh, however you want to express that. But, but, you know, I'm helping this guy out today. He's going to help me out to, or somebody else is going to help me out tomorrow. It's this pay it forward kind of mentality. Yeah, I love it. Um, so, so before you got into indie publishing, you said that uh, you've always wanted to be a writer. Was there um, an author growing up that just really inspired you to, to think that way? Um, not a specific author. I used to read, uh, I read Star Trek books before reading Star Trek books was cool. Um, this would be like the mid seventies when Bantam was publishing them before pocket books came along and, and the, the industry that it is now came along. Um, but I read every Star Trek book I could get my hands on. I read the James Blish adaptations of the original series episodes, uh, in the, the Star Trek books that he put together. I read, uh, Alan Dean Foster's Star Trek logs, which were, uh, I would say novella length adaptations of the Star Trek, uh, animated series, uh, scripts, uh, that I really enjoyed. I would sit in my parents' car in the garage, not in the summertime. Uh, <laughs> it's very hot in Texas in the summertime. <laughs> yep. Uh, 
Uh, but I would sit in my parents' car in the garage and just read the Star Trek log books by Foster. Um, so, and then, and then there were individual books that came out. Uh, Marshak and Colbreth published, uh, The Fate of the, Fe- the, The Price of the Phoenix and The Fate of the Phoenix, which were a duology, uh, around Kirk being captured by a, a guy named Omni and, uh, Spock and the Romulan commander from the Enterprise Incident episode get together and, and try to rescue him. And anyway, you could tell by the details that I'm relating from when I was 12 that those books had a lot of, uh, a big impression on me. Right. Um, and so just reading the sci fi and Star Trek that I had watched on TV and loved and that just really, uh, encouraged my love of, of writing and reading and all of that, uh, symbiosis that goes together between the two. Gotcha. What what was it about Star Trek that you that you just love so much? Well, uh, so I'm watching the reruns that became popular in the early 70s as a kid, right? Some eight or ten. Uh, obviously, as a young boy developing at eight or ten, you know, Kirk is uh, and his his heroism and his command and his um, way with the ladies and all of those things that that appeal to a young boy appeal to me. Uh, Spock, of course, was a fascinating character. Uh, yes, the pun was intended. Um, because he was so detached and yet, uh, had such a strength about him, uh, through that detachment, through that, I wouldn't call him emotionless, if anything, uh, just the opposite, but controlled. And so that was an interesting, um, uh, counterman to Kirk's, uh, go get him, uh, take charge approach. And then of course you had McCoy with the wry sense of humor. Uh, Bugs Bunny was probably one of my favorite characters as a kid growing up because he's such a smart ass. <laughs> uh, and, and Bones McCoy had that sort of same quality about him. And so just, uh, Roddenberry's equation for that, that triad of characters and, uh, taking them through these, uh, um, adventures with these different races and the, the starship battles and all that is just, you know, very, very, uh, adventure oriented and, and great, um, Great nu- nutrients, uh, I would say, for a, a young boy who's um, just learning to, you know, what it means to be to become a man, and and also uh, what makes a great story. Um, so all of that is all wrapped up together for me, and and that's, uh, you know, Star Trek's hope for the future, the fact that uh, all these races were living together in, in relative harmony, uh, Klingons and Romulans notwithstanding. Um, but that, that you needed that, uh, they learned that on next generation. You know, you can't, you can't, everybody can't live in harmony or you don't have much of a television show. Right. You know, it's kind of boring <laughs> after a while, like right. after five minutes. Uh, so, so that was fun too. Uh, so seeing the, seeing how the, that discord was most of the time, uh, brought together through some sort of harmonic thing, whether the, the Organians come in and enforce a peace treaty on the Federation and the Klingons or, you know, whatever the situation might be. And, and Roddenberry was dealing with some things that were no doubt, um, in my subconscious, you know, I was a kid raised in a small town in Texas in the early seventies. So, you know, race is there, race Mm -hmm. is there. So episodes like let that be your last battlefield where you have, one, you have these two guys that are basically uh, killing one, trying to kill one another. They end up killing their two races on their planet. One's black on the right side, white on the left side. The other's white on the right side, black on the left side. I mean, it, it doesn't get more uh, uh, morality play than that for a show that's being made in the late 60s when, you know, civil rights is happening in 68 and the Kennedys are getting shot and all that stuff. Martin Luther King's getting shot. Uh, so anyway, uh, there was just a lot going on at that time in that particular point in history that, that Roddenberry was dealing with. Um, and it, I, I think whether I knew it or not, that stuff was percolating in my head, even as a kid in the, in the seventies. Right. So I guess awkward transition. Let's get back to your books here. <laughs> uh, so, so oh, the, by all means be awkward. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the first book you published and uh, self published, you said was shadows burned in. Um, right. What was the inspiration for that book? Um, well, my, um, my relationship with my dad was complicated as uh, many uh, folks are. Uh, so uh, when he passed away in 2003, I had started writing the book, uh, earlier than that. Uh, but th- the book basically deals with three generations in a small Texas town uh, and the way uh, parents can influence their kids uh, and not, not necessarily in good ways, not necessarily in bad ways either. Uh, good and bad, of course. Um, but 
uh, the book deals with those three generations and the legacy of uh, one generation's impressions on the next generation. And uh, long story short, writing it was uh, very cathartic after my dad passed away. So it, it, it helped me reconcile myself to that relationship um, and uh, actually got me to understand him a lot better than I think I would have otherwise. Gotcha. Um, so is the next uh, story you started writing after that one your Tales of B Company? Um, let's see. What was the first? Th yeah, the actually the first thing I wrote, uh, I started talking to Michael Bunker about a, um, a collection of short stories set in his Pennsylvania world. Okay. Gotcha. And, uh, he said, yeah, you want to, you want to, since you volunteered the idea, why don't you volunteer to do it? <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so anyway, we put together a, a compilation and my contribution to that was called glass and height. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so the very first thing I wrote after about, 15 years, well, I guess less than that, uh, 14 years of not writing anything other than rewriting shadows so many times to get all that academic language out, um, was, uh, glass and height. And Michael responded to that very well and readers have responded to it very well. So I was, I was pretty happy with the way it turned out, that story. And one of the characters in that story, uh, and I don't want to go into who it is because I don't want to give away if you haven't read the story, but, uh, one of the characters in that story wouldn't leave me alone. And so I was like, okay, well, what would this character be like down the road, you know, with the, the transport of the transport authority in Pennsylvania, the world of Pennsylvania is sort of the evil empire. Uh, if you think of it in star Wars terms, so I was like, well, what would this character be like, uh, fighting against the transport authority later? Uh, and so that's where Gettysburg and then, um, uh, Susquehanna and then Columbia, the three B company books, came from simply that character in that short story wouldn't leave me alone. So I ended up writing three novellas, <laughs> right? That included the character and I liked them. So thank you for writing them. That's really uh, all that matters, man. Um, so what was it about Mike, uh, Michael Bunker's Pennsylvania that really drew you into wanting to write in, in that world? Um, well, kind of like Star Trek, I guess it was just a unique, you know, he, he's the king of Amish sci-fi or whatever, whatever title he gave himself or other people gave him. I forget now, but, uh, the, the, the whole idea of having an, an Amish culture set in a future dystopian sci-fi world, uh, was, was pretty innovative and pretty interesting to me because I like doing that in my own novels. I like taking characters that you might not like on page one and, uh, trying to get you to like them by page 300. Uh, I like, I like those big arcs, you know, I like change. I like seeing what happens to these people uh, as the story progresses. And, and so you had this, this sort of Amish group of people in this dystopian sci-fi future that's very tech heavy, uh, as it must be, uh, given the, the nature of the future, right? Uh, and I just thought that tension and, um, that combination of uh, the uh, traditional lifestyle and traditional values of the Amish set in the sci-fi community, uh, sci-fi world, uh, was an interesting uh, dynamic to explore because, again, you've got sort of point A to point Z, and then you, 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 ma you make the connection over the course of the story. And so I, I enjoyed that a lot. Awesome. Um, and then next up for you, I believe, was Unconditional, right? Uh, yeah, I've forgotten my own publishing history here, <laughs> but yeah, I, yeah, I wrote, I think Unconditional, uh, uh, I saw a picture on Facebook by Stefan Boltz. He'd posted a picture of his dog, Ember, uh, and the dog was just sort of standing in the middle of this lonely country road, sort of looking up the road. And it looked like the perspective shot, if you ever watch The Walking Dead, you, you know, they have these long camera angles where they look up these, look down these long, empty roads with the leaves blowing across the roads. And of course, the point is, you know, civilization is gone. There are no cars driving on the road. It's supposed to, to uh, reinforce the whole idea of the world has gone to, gone to crap, right? Right. Uh, and nobody's around and, and the, the apocalypse has happened. Well, that's how this picture of Ember struck me. And I immediately had in my head, oh, oh, uh, this is a Walking Dead story from the perspective of a dog. Mm -hmm. uh, and that just kind of percolated for a while. I was like, eh, I'm not sure how to write this. And I kind of had in mind the ending before I started. And I was like, nobody's going to like this ending. So I, I, don't know, I probably shouldn't do that. So I, kind of, I was kind of, honestly, I was kind of afraid to write the story because I thought if I wrote it and I published it and I got a bunch of one star reviews, uh, because nobody liked the ending or whatever the per, you know, nobody liked it then. Well, that would hurt my overall author profile on Amazon. And I was like, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. And I was still fairly new, uh, at 
indie publishing. I don't think I'd even published, I think I'd published maybe two of the B company stories. So I was still new, fairly new at the whole game and trying to figure all that out. Still am actually. Uh, but, uh, I finally said I, it wouldn't leave me alone. It was like the character from glass and height wouldn't leave me alone. I had to write the story. So I wrote the story and it turned out fairly successfully as it, as it turns out. Yeah. It's a great story. And like you said, not, not ruin it for people. The ending I did not see coming and I liked it. I really, That's good. I I think it's one of the best short stories I probably read last year. Um, oh, thank you. I really liked it. And so then that led you to, uh, I guess, deciding to do Tales of the Apocalypse. Why did you decide to – was it all because of Unconditional that you did Tales of uh, the Apocalypse? Well, pretty much, yeah. I mean the res- the results of that story, the way it was received, and, and um, I, I was kind of blown away and uh, very gratified, first of all, that my one-star – nightmare hadn't happened uh but not only that but it kind of went in the other direction you know it was it was it was very well received actually and i thought well you know that's actually not something i've ever seen done before is is an anthology of, of lots of apocalyptic anthologies out there or at least apocalyptic stories and some apocalyptic anthologies uh but always from the human perspective what what about it from the animal's perspective or what about featuring an animal as a hero i mean and i think that's what really appealed to people in unconditional is that the animal it's told in third person but you never see any other perspective than the animal's perspective and so by definition the animal is the hero in the story mm-hmm. Uh, and I thought, you know, nobody's actually done an anthology of that. If this was this successful as a single story, I wonder how an anthology would do. Uh, and so, yes, so that's how Tales of the Apocalypse happened. Did you have a hard time finding authors or narrowing down a list of authors to be in that anthology? Definitely narrowing down the list just because there are so many talented people out there. Mm -hmm. Um, But I had been in a a couple of anthologies with most of the authors that you see in Tales, um, and I had become acquainted with them uh, through Facebook or or being in the anthologies with them or whatever. And so I kind of went to my – first of all – I wanted to make sure that any author I, I asked to be in the anthology uh, was talented. So, um, again, that narrowing that list down was pretty difficult. But, uh, you know, I only had so much – I was going to pay these people too. So I only had so much capital to, to put out. But I also only had so much room in the anthology. So I had to narrow that list down. Uh, but most, most of them are good friends of mine now, and uh, I had been associated with them before. So – uh, that's where, that's how they got to get a slot in the anthology. Was there any process of putting that anthology together that was, I guess, the hardest for you to do? Uh, probably the most frightening aspect of it for me was the marketing. Fortunately, David Bruns, who's also in the anthology, uh, sort of took the mantle on that. He actually volunteered. And I was like, oh, sure, absolutely. Please do this. <laughs> Uh, saves me the headache and, uh, I'm sure you know better than what you're doing than I do. So please, by all means. Um, so he kind of did that. In fact, it was him, it was David that came up with the, uh, the idea of pairing us with Pets for Vets, which we benefited, uh, the, the sales we launched in November of 2015 and all the sales through the rest of that calendar year. Uh, and, uh, uh, one of the authors gave, uh, Deidre Gould gave her author fee. So the sales plus Dieter's fee plus uh, some sales from Todd Barcelo, who did the um, the uh, audiobook and the, the paperback through uh, Auspicious Apparatus Press, um, those went to uh, tail uh, to sorry to tails the Michaels. Those went to <laughs> Pets for Vets in January, uh, okay. so we were able to give them a nice check. That's awesome. Um, do you plan on doing a second one? I'd like to. Uh, first thing I'd like to do is recover my costs on the first one, right? Uh, which I haven't done yet. I, I here's my, and I'm not too worried about that. Here's my philosophy of recovering costs. My job is to produce a quality work, book, short story, anthology, whatever. In the case of Tales, a quality anthology of great stories that that receives uh, hopefully good reviews on Amazon over time. That will recover costs. It might take 10 years. It won't be in the first six months, maybe, uh, but it'll recover its costs. So once I feel comfortable that I've gotten enough of that back, I wouldn't mind doing a second volume. It was a great – I mean, I, I, other than the marketing, I, d- I did some of that too, uh, reached out to Goodreads groups and you know people like that, went on podcasts and stuff. I did some of that too, um, although David was sort of the mastermind for all that. But 
Um, I did all of the editing, uh, except for a final proofread that I, I paid a good editor friend of mine to do. But uh, I did all of the editing. And by that, I mean, you know, some people have a conception of what an editor is and sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. There's, there's different levels of editing. There's, there is developmental editing where I say, well, this character was this way earlier in the story. Now they're this way. That's not really consistent. Let's talk about how to make that character consistent. Uh, language choice. Uh, are you going to use contractions or not? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, those are, those are developmental editing tasks. Then there's line editing, which I call proofreading, which is basically looking for typos and spelling errors and things like that. I did pretty much all of that for all of the stories in the anthology. Um, except I did have a final pair of eyes look over the each story at the end when everything else was done, because by then I wouldn't have been able to see any final typos. Uh, so that was a pretty uh, uh, labor intensive endeavor. And I, I think I've gotten some compliments on the quality of the, the anthology itself beyond the quality of the stories individually, but just that the anthology was, was put together pretty well. So I think I've got that down now. So yeah, I wouldn't mind doing a second volume of that or, or uh, any other uh, topic, actually. Uh, I enjoy editing. Some people are good at editing. Some people are good at writing. I think I have a, um, some uh, modest ability at both, and I enjoy both. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I wouldn't mind doing a second volume, just not anytime soon. Right. Because <laughs> i got a lot of things on my plate. Do you have any ideas for any other kind of anthology you'd like to put out maybe before you did a second Tales? Um. There's one idea that's kind of percolating, but I don't want to go into it right now because it's kind of based in a world um, that hasn't quite gone public yet that I created. So uh, I do have an idea, um, and we'll see how that comes to fruition over time. Sounds good. Now, I knew there was an Audible book for Tales, but I'm going to have to go yes. uh, look at it because I've just recently started getting into um, – listening to some audio books. So I'm, I'll probably, once we get done, go buy that one and I've, uh, listen to it the next time I'm in the car. Oh, cool. It's such a great, uh, for anybody, really anybody that has not checked it out, you need to go check out this tales of the apocalypse and it's T A I L S. Right. Like a dog's tail. Right. Um, right. So, so that's highly, Bugs Bunny. That's Bugs Bunny's influence right there. I'm yeah. just being a smart ass with the wording. Yeah. <laughs> in tales of the apocalypse, is there any, I know it's hard cause they're probably all babies of yours. Is there any story that, stuck out to you the most in that anthology oh man ask a mother to pick her favorite <laughs> child god man uh not i don't want to say because if, if i'm gonna immediately leave somebody out i mean i liked all of them for they're their, all for good their, yeah for their various approaches i mean okay i will say that to have nick cole's tomorrow found which is set in his old man in the wasteland universe and Ed Robertson's When You Open the Cages for Those Who Can't, which is set in his Breakers universe, in the anthology was a bit surreal. Because if you remember, they were two of the three authors, and those were two of the three books that I read uh, early on and realized that you could publish independently and still be a great writer, uh, that it wasn't like Vanity Press. Uh, and so it was a bit surreal to have them in the anthology with short stories set in those worlds, uh, because they, the reading their stuff, uh, in 2012 or whenever it was, was just, uh, was such an inspiration to me. And so it was, I, I kind of, you know, I felt like, uh, the student who had the professor, um, you know, come in and, and, uh, write an article and put it in the, put it in the collection, uh, the student's collection in a way. So it was, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed, and, and uh, I, I really enjoyed working on their stories with them and just having them in the collection. I know the one that sticks out to me, um, and I don't know why, but I discovered this author because of you, or started reading the author because of this anthology, was David Bruns and his story, um, The Water Finder's Shadow. Yes. I love that, that, if I had to pick, I guess yours and his would be the top two stories for me in that anthem. I'll, those are the two that really stick out in my mind the most. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because his leads the anthology off and, and mine. Really, the reason I put mine at the end 
uh, was, and it's totally me being anal retentive, was that the whole thing started with unconditional and uh, the reaction to that, right? So that was the beginning point of the anthology, if you think about it. And I thought, well, it's appropriate then to bookend the whole process by putting unconditional at the end of the anthology. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why I put it there. But it's interesting that you picked – I agree. David's story was, was brilliant. And then he, I typically beta read for him. He beta reads for me too. And I told him when I read the story, I thought it was the best short story of his that I had ever read. Oh, wow. That's pretty high praise. Um, go, uh, for, you mentioned the layout. Did you lay out the stories in a particular order on purpose? Like, it seemed like you might have some stories that readers might not like followed by one that will make you feel better. Did you do that on purpose? I, I did to a certain extent. I mean, I didn't give the, the only thing I told the authors was, look, an animal needs to be really important in the story, either as a character or from the, or, or as the perspective of, for the reader. Uh, and it needs to be post apocalyptic. Uh, other than that, do whatever you want. Time period, genre, I don't care. Uh, and so that's a pretty broad canvas to give somebody. And so I got a lot of different stories, which was great. I wanted the variety that I got. It was great. Um, there were lots of dogs. One of some of the comments we got were, we need more cats. <laughs> uh, you know, Jennifer, uh, the poetry Santiago by Jennifer Ellis, uh, was a great cat story. Well, mm -hmm. people liked it so much they wanted more cats. So if we do a second version, I'll have to put a cat caveat, uh, in the requirements. Uh, but, um, I, I did try to balance, uh, happier stories with stories that were less happy. Uh, I don't want to say tragic necessarily, but you know, I mean, it's the apocalypse and, animals die just like people die mm -hmm. uh so i did try to uh, balance that out a little bit for the reader uh so yeah the the the, the difference that you noticed was uh, was by design well guys that's all the time we've got for part one make sure you tune in for part two where chris takes on questions from your fans and the legendary ending and until next time guys stay legendary Oh, screwed that one up. Blooper reel.